I'll talk a bit about uh, the, the motivation and sort of the intellectual inspiration behind the book and then uh, highlight some of the, what I think are the key points uh, when, with just uh, a few uh, slides to indicate uh, some, something about the contents of this book. Uh, so uh, with the, the motivation and the inspiration, uh, so I, uh, my background, is, as most of you know, is in comparative historical sociology. And uh, in uh, studying in that field, I became a bit disappointed, if you will, in the fact that uh, uh, you have this, this subfield that studies comparative and historical uh, change uh, and has a lot to say about the rise of the state, state formation, a lot to say about the rise of capitalism, uh, more recently uh, talking about uh, colonialism, uh, development, and so on, uh, is uh, 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 missing a kind of historical analysis of the socialist experience. It's sort of conspicuously lacking from that whole tradition. I found that a bit, always a bit puzzling. And of course, there are explanations for it. Well, you know, there's the division of labor in American academia with that part of the world studied by the Sovietologists, and so the comparative historical people were more sort of Western centered and so on. But I think that doesn't really quite justify that kind of a division. So the book was in a part motivated, motivated by an effort to sort of fill that gap um, and apply both the methods but also the thinking of comparative and historical analysis to the socialist and post socialist experience. Um, the other uh, motivation came from a, another tradition which emerged uh, after the Cold War and after the fall of communism, which was the uh, what came to be known as the transitological perspective, and which was quite dominant when I was in graduate school and uh, studying this part of the world. And uh, this mainly originated in political science, and this became a kind of a, an analysis that talked about transitions to democracy and markets, but it tended to pretty much erase anything that happened prior to 1989, right? It was kind of a, uh, a fresh start historically, and nothing really mattered what happened in the past, and so we can sort of have like this horse race of countries competing to become more democratic and more capitalist, but it never quite, it never quite connected to anything that happened in, in prior history. So comparative historical analysis, transitology, and here's through my, my sort of, my, my entry into this problem of studying uh, uh, the globalization of, uh, of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so, uh, in the slides I have, uh, let's see, I have uh, essentially uh, these two quotes and I have three figures and then a table. So that's all I have to show. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll be using them, again, mainly for illustration. I, they're not kind of the primary uh, parts of the book, but they, I think, illustrate some of the, the, the main points that I try to make in it. Uh, so in the book, I tell the history of, uh, I, I take a very developmentalist approach uh, to, this, to this book. Uh, so I, I tell the story of uh, the industrialization of uh, the socialist world after 1945 and sort of the intense process of industrialization that took place under the, the Stalinist system of central planning. And uh, there came a period in which uh, that kind of uh, uh, process, while producing certain results, uh, it did massively industrialize this part of the world, uh, came to a kind of exhaustion. Right? It sort of seemed to reach its limits. And the planners and policymakers in the socialist world were aware of this. They were aware that they were industrializing, but they were falling behind in technology. They were falling behind behind in efficiency, excuse me, uh, and in many other ways, and they try to uh, play catch up. And uh, one of the ways to do this, and this is where this intersects with the kind of the narrative on the rise of globalization, is that they begin to see opportunities in the newly emerging global economy that's taking shape in the 1970s and the 1980s, the rise of transnational production, uh, global finance, uh, and uh, uh, East Asian uh, developmentalism, uh, all these changes are, are have, have an impact on the policymakers in this part of the world. So this is very much against this idea that this part of the world was closed off and they really had no clue what was happening anywhere else and sort of pursued this autarky and so on. This was really not, not quite what was happening. And there are these two quotes that I think capture the policy and the approach that uh, these countries took in, beginning in the 1970s. Um, the, the first is a quote from a official from uh, 
inter-cooperation, which, uh, so under the socialist system, uh, foreign trade was organized uh, initially through foreign ministries or foreign trade ministries, but then it became devolved onto what were called foreign trade organizations. And so the foreign trade organizations were, were the ones that handled all of the trade, uh, the, 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 the enterprises produced the goods, the foreign trade organization would then uh, uh, export them and import other goods and so on. They would handle this export and import business uh, separately. Uh, in the 1970s, Hungary set up a foreign trade organization that was specifically tasked with expanding trade with the capitalist countries. This was a, a, a foreign trade organization that was uh, specialized in trading with the West. And as you can see from the quote, uh, the director at the time, and this reflects the policy view at the time, that they're aware that there are these uh, tectonic shifts taking place in the world economy, and they want to find a role for themselves in it. Right? They want to connect with transnational production, with technology, with finance, in some way to find a role for the socialist world in this global division of labor. Uh, a year later, you see a quote from Brezhnev, and now this becomes an official policy, essentially. Um, although, again, these, these policies had started in some of the smaller countries, and then ultimately uh, again, reach the Soviet Union, uh, this idea that we would uh, cooperate with Western firms. And uh, what you see there is that formula that became quite central in the way in which this took place because there existed all kinds of restrictions for trade, for uh, uh, transferring technology, for currency, and all kinds of things. Uh, that it would rely on these, what came to be known as cooperation agreements. Right? These were cooperation agreements that were signed between uh, Western firms on the one, one end, and then either the socialist governments or enterprises on the other. And uh, it would involve some process where some technology would be transferred, some production would take place in the socialist countries, and some of the goods that were produced under license would then be exported back to the West. Right? This kind of sounds familiar. Right? This is pretty much transnational production. Right? And the good thing about um, the fact that uh, the U.S. and many Western policymakers were concerned about this process because it involved technology transfer, uh, uh, possibly the transfer of technologies that had what was called dual use, right? You transfer, you give them these microprocessors, which so they can take and turn into improving weaponry, right? So there were national security concerns. Uh, the point is that th th these, these, um, these cooperation agreements were heavily uh, tracked and monitored, which then gave be a great basis for data, which I could use then to show that uh, these uh, were quite extensive uh, throughout the former socialist bloc. Okay, so this is the, you might call it, what I call it kind of proto-globalization under socialism, right? You might say, well, sure that took place, but what does it really matter uh, for what happened, what happened after 1989? The Soviet system collapsed, the central planning collapsed, so none of, the, none of this really matters. Well, that's where I try to show um, Oh, before I go there, uh, just to illustrate the intensity of this relationship that happened during that time, this, this graph here will show um, the level of foreign debt that socialist economies were uh, accumulating beginning in 1970. Right? So huge growth in debt, uh, and part of this was, again, due to the opening of global finance, the fact that you had all these petrodollars, uh, euro currency markets, offshore banking emerging that could, uh, that were not unregulated and that, that, that these governments could tap into and borrow all this, all this money, dollars and uh, Deutsche Marks and yen and so on and engage and use, especially for this financing this foreign trade. And the reason for this is because their currencies were non-convertible, so they couldn't use, you couldn't use rubles or other local currencies to pay for uh, importing goods from the West. You had to tap into these financial markets to get uh, the finance to pay for these goods, right? And the idea was that we would borrow now, invest in the next port, and make the money later. Didn't quite uh, turn out that way, but that's, I think you see that intensity of that, that engagement with both the, the financial side and the industrial side of the capitalist uh, of world economy. Okay, so what, the, what, does the, what does this matter, or what relevance is this for the post-socialist era? And uh, this, is a chart that shows um, uh, the, the uh, x-axis is 
the total number of interfirm agreements as existed in 1984, as were tracked by, in particular, the OECD. So the number of these agreements that involve some kind of co-production, some kind of uh, technology transfer, some kind of cooperation between Western firms and uh, enterprises in the socialist bloc. And then the level of foreign direct investment, the stock of foreign direct investment in 1995. Right? You can see it's quite closely correlated that the more open the economy was or the more exposed it was to these ties in the 1980s, the more likely was it to receive foreign investment in the 1990s. Right? And so this does away with that, that, that discontinuity uh, argument that, well, nothing really matters. You know, anything that happened prior to 1989 is really irrelevant. Right? But this, I think, shows that there are important continuities in the realm of at least production that are taking place uh, here. Okay. Uh, so that then uh, the second part of the book is uh, once once I make this argument that there was a kind of proto globalization process taking place during the socialist era that it mattered for the post socialist era, I want to tra uh, 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 trace the transformation of the Central and East European economies as they become more deeply integrated into the emerging global economy of the 1990s and the and the 2000s. Um, this is the case in particular because if you look at the figures uh, nowadays, the Central and East European economies are pretty much one of the most globalized in the world compared to any region, other region in the world, compared to Latin America, compared to East Asia. If you look at measures of foreign direct investment, if you look at the involvement of transnational industry in the local economies, um, financial integration a little less so, but these first uh, two components are quite deeply indicative of the depth of, it, of globalization that has taken place and that, that characterizes these countries today. And the question is, well, uh, not to, to be a good uh, political economist, well, you know, what, what did politics have to do with how these countries then ended up where they did? Uh, and the, the, the argument being that I don't want to sort of just give a it's kind of an evolutionary economic argument that says, well, this process began in this period and just sort of kind of continued uh, in the 1990s and the 2000s. There were important political decisions that were made that shifted the economic base in one direction or another. And what uh, became apparent as I looked at the countries during this period is that there is a, a kind of divergence within the region. And this chart captures a bit of that divergence. Uh, you look at, uh, this is the ratio of foreign to domestic value added uh, in the exports of the country. So uh, if you think of any country that's part of a globalized chain of production, where they import certain goods, they perform some tasks to it, and then they export the good out. right? And it's sort of a processing, uh, part of the processing chain of production. To what extent is uh, that, ex that final export, does it contain uh, a lot of domestic value added, or is it mainly that you have uh, foreign goods brought into the country, there's an assembly process, and it's exported out, where the domestic value added is quite low. And uh, Slovakia is a great example of this. Uh, Slovakia, I don't know if, how many of you know this, but Slovakia is one of the world's largest automobile exporters on a per capita basis. Uh, I think it's second or third in the world, or, or maybe may even be first, I'm not quite sure. Uh, of course, you know, Slovakia as a small country, it doesn't really uh, consume all the cars that it produces. But it's a major assembly point for a lot of major transnational automobile producers that uh, essentially use Slovakia as a base of operations to uh, assemble the components that are made elsewhere. Uh, a lot of German auto automobile makers are present there, Japanese, uh, American, so they bring the parts into Slovakia, the car is assembled, then it's sold in the European markets. Uh, uh, so the point being that the value added process in Slovakia is actually quite low because it's just the final assembly. Right? Some countries do a little better because they actually produce goods that are uh, have higher value added contained in them. And I try to trace back this to uh, political developments in the 1990s in the sense that there was, in the 1990s, uh, 
uh, an effort to pursue a kind of developmentalist, a neo-developmentalist neo path in some of these countries. Um, that it wasn't just about sort of embracing the, the global economy and opening up and just allowing foreign investment, and, and this is kind of the, the dominant narrative. Uh, so there was a, 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 a neo-developmentalist moment in the 1990s. And the argument being, kind of to give you, in a nutshell, that the countries that pursued this, even if it failed, ultimately, were able to retain a greater amount of domestic capacities than, than countries that kind of wholeheartedly embraced globalization in the 1990s. As was Hungary, for example. Hungary opened up its economy. Uh, there was a, uh, the policymakers decided that our, the way of saving our industries is to sell off all of our assets to foreign investors and allow it to be taken over. Uh, so the story being that, ironically, the countries that pursued globalization uh, uh, the hardest ended up the worse off than those that were a bit more cautious in that process. Right? So that's, that's kind of the argument here. And so ultimately, and I look at several other dimensions, and I won't go into that here, but that gives me a kind of typology uh, that I develop in the book that we see essentially three types of international, what I call international economic roles that are assumed in the region in the era of globalization. So we have the assembly platforms, right, that, uh, that perform more uh, lower value added tasks. These include Hungary and Slovakia. We have these intermediate producers that are a bit more focused in producing uh, intermediate goods, uh, components, and so on. They're not really known for uh, kind of high-end products, but produce more of these, these intermediate products. These are the Czech Republic and Slovenia. And then we have what I call these combined cases, Poland, Romania, and Bulgaria, and it's mainly because um, they also have pretty large domestic markets. So they're not as export specialized as the first four sets of countries. And that's part of the other indi indicators that I look at in terms of creating this, this kind of mapping of this, uh, this differentiation between the countries. Uh, okay, and that's pretty much all I have. So thank Thanks you. A lot.